But before we get started with going on to the particular tools, I did want to kind of lay some groundwork here in case um, you're not familiar or <coughs> excuse me, we're just like a refresher on some of the background technology and terminology. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about linked data. Um, as I said, the proposed replacement for MARC encoding is called BibFrame, and it is what they call a linked data model. So I want to talk just a little bit about what we mean when we say linked data. Um, here, to start with, is an official definition, I suppose, official meaning it's something that I didn't come up with. Um, it's from Wikipedia, and you know you can read what it says, but the main things I wanted to highlight is that linked data is a method of publishing structured data. It's important to know that it's structured and not just put up there in whatever format people want, um, so that it can be interlinked. That is an important point of it, is linking data from different sources. And it is encoded in a way that can be read not just by humans, but automatically by computers. So those are kind of the three main things I like to point out about linked data. To kind of illustrate that more, um, this is sort of what web pages look like encoded in standard hypertext markup language, HTML. Yes, they're linked. Um, you may say, what's well, the big deal about linked data? We have links now, right? Um, we do, but they're linked to kind of these monolithic resources, and the links don't really say a lot about why um, people are, or why these things are linked together. And in a linked data um, universe, um, the links instead of linking to just pages would link to discrete pieces of data within a web resource, and the links would have a lot more encoded in them that says how these pieces of data are related. So here is you know what HTML looks like now. Um, those tags, H1 and the P tags, they tell the computer this is a heading and this is a paragraph, but it doesn't really tell the computer anything about what type of information is encoded. Basically, all the computer can get is how to display this information. It knows to make the um, the heading slightly bigger and in bold type compared to the paragraph, but it doesn't say anything about what the information in those paragraphs or headings are. Contrast this to a piece of data uh, set up according to the resource description framework, RDF, and encoded in XML, extensible markup language. I promise I'm not going to throw too much of this code at you, but I think I just wanted to show you this chunk so you can see where the information um, is encoded, what they, what they mean when they say that computers can understand the information. Um, this piece of code is about, it's describing this particular resource, which in this case is a CD, and you can see from the computer encoding that the artist of this CD is Bob Dylan, it was produced in the USA by Columbia, etc., etc. Um, basically, all this information is encoded right there so the computer can understand it. And so, um, in addition to having this encoded meaning, the other part that's important about linked data is that relationships are key. We are used as human consumers of web pages to connecting pieces of information based on their context. If we look at a catalog record, for example, and we see title, A Christmas Carol, author Charles Dickens, we know that that means that Charles Dickens wrote the Christmas, A Christmas Carol. A computer has no way of telling that relationship. So with linked data, it makes the relationships explicit to computers. Um, if you read anything about linked data and about RDF, um, you will hear the phrase triples. Um, RDF is kind of based on triples, which are statements. Um, they're called triples because they have three parts, subject, predicate, and object, just like sentences. Um, and so the subject and the object are two entities that are linked together by the predicate, which is the relationship between them. So if you're describing the resource, a Christmas carol, um, the relationship is has author, and the other entity that is linked by that relationship is Charles Dickens. And so ideally, um, this, these linking and relationships would be linked together within this RDF code um, instead of um, having all of the information supplied by text in these, you could have URIs, Uniform Resource Identifiers, that link to various sources. And so that would be 
truly the real strength of uh, linked data when you're not just encoding all this data yourself, but you are linking it out to other sources that have already been made available in a linked data format. And so the end result of that is that um, the web of data, linked data, can be crawled by following these RDF links. And so um, it basically turns the whole web into a search engine or um, an API, an application programming interface. Um, you can bring together different sources of data on the fly and just creates a whole new uh, realm of search queries. You know, you're probably used to seeing examples of things like this in your daily life. If you go to Google and you type in Chevy Chase, um, probably even before you finish typing it along the right-hand side of your search results, you'll see a box like this. Um, this is not coded ahead of time. This is all brought together from various sources. Um, things like Wikipedia um, and other various sources, probably IMDb, they can bring his Twitter profile in. Um, all of these are encoded in a way that uh, allows it to be brought together on the fly. And so this happens if you type in Chevy Chase. If you keep typing and just type the letters M-A in, all of a sudden Google knows that you are not talking about Chevy Chase the actor, but you're talking about Chevy Chase the town in Maryland. And now there is a whole a different set of data that is pulled up, again, automatically through linked data technology because things are encoded this way. And so, you know, that's the type of world we're talking about when we talk about linked data. And these days, you know, it doesn't even have to be on your computer. It can happen on your phone if you have a smartphone. Um, I have an Android phone and, you know, I can find that, you know, going to the Google Now app, um, it'll pull up things from weather based on my location. Um, it will, pull out things about my flights I have coming up based on my email. Um, you know, if I've given information that I'm interested in particular baseball teams, it can pull up scores on that. You know, that's another example of ways in which linked data is kind of, you know, it's, it's creating a world that we're used to right now. You know, we are used to being able to find information from a variety of sources without necessarily having to go to a bunch of different um, websites. You know, just kind of brainstorming and following this to maybe some logical or perhaps not so logical conclusions. Um, I always like to draw in the concept of the Amazon Echo when I talk about this. I have one at home um, and I don't know, wouldn't necessarily say it's based on linked data technology now, it's more just the magic of Amazon and their database, but you know an Echo is a device that will sit in the corner of your house and you can ask it questions, it'll you know search the internet for you, it'll draw things from Wikipedia, um, and I'm, you know, just kind of thinking extensions in a linked data world, you know, perhaps an application to libraries, wouldn't it be cool if you could ask your Amazon Echo, does my library have a particular book and can I place a hold on it? And, you know, that's the type of thing that might be possible if libraries are engaged in a linked data world. <clears throat> So along those lines, that's maybe one answer to this question. Um, hopefully I haven't totally bored you <laughs> to death talking about linked data, but um, if so, uh, maybe this next part will be a little bit more relevant, talking about why libraries and librarians should care about linked data. Well, in one word, um, BibFrame. <laughs> um, as I mentioned before, the Library of Congress is currently working on a replacement for the MARC 21 encoding standard machine readable cataloging. Um, they released a statement um, a few years ago saying that they are going to replace MARC. Um, this sort of came out of the test of the National Libraries did with the RDA cataloging rules. One of the stipulations of the test report was that in order for RDA to be implemented, we really need to be working on a replacement for MARC because the RDA cataloging rules are kind of restrained by MARC in our current environment. And so the result of that was BibFrame, which stands for, it's an abbreviation for uh, the Bibliographic Framework Transition Initiative. Um, they always capitalize it. All, let, all the letters are capitalized, even though it's not really an acronym, it's just an abbreviation. But the Library of Congress's statement said that something new is now needed. You know, MARC was, is a 40-something year old um, technology. It was came up with in the 1960s, and it was really revolutionary at the time, but it was used for printing catalog cards, and we've sort of modified it to be our online catalog um, encoding standard, and it's really just kind of out of sync with the rest of the 
computer science community, the World Wide Web, and so in order to play nicely with the rest of the information out there on the web, um, we really need to move beyond beyond Mark, move on to something different. And the Library of Congress has chosen a linked data um, model, a way of doing things. And so if you're interested in more information about BibFrame, um, the Library of Congress has some information on their website at loc.gov slash BibFrame. They also have another domain name devoted specifically to BibFrame at BibFrame.org, and that is the site that has some of the tools that I'm going to be talking about later in this presentation. <clears throat> and when I'm talking about why um, linked data and BibFrame are important to libraries and what could be different in a linked data um, library catalog, I like to point to the example of a project called OpenCat, which took place in France. And they used to have a live prototype site that I really liked to um, show people some example searches in, and I've recently discovered that that is no longer available. Um, perhaps they are moving beyond the prototype phase and working towards making this a reality, so I'm just going to do my best to explain what this project is without being able to do um, test searches, but I still think it's a couple of resources where you can read about this project. Um, what OpenCAT is, is it's a collaboration between the French National Library, the BNF, and a public library in a suburb of France. And their project is an attempt to supplement the catalog of the public library with some data and bibliographic information from um, the French National Library. So for example, one of the test searches I used to do when the prototype was available was for Victor Hugo in the public library's catalog. And you would get the typical things. Um, a list of what the public library held by Victor Hugo, but there would also be links to um, information about Victor Hugo from the National Library, um, their archival material, things like that, also even um, virtual exhibits that were online that um, talked about the life of Victor Hugo, and all of this was created on the fly using linked data technology. These were not pages that were programmed ahead of time. It was just the way that the data from the public library and the French National Library were encoded. Um, and like I said, the, um, the prototype site is no longer live, but I found a really good article that explains how it works, and the URL for that is there. Um, I should at this point also mention that I will be sending my slides to Krista, the normal, usual host of Encompass Live, and so she will have all these URLs, and she will make them available when the recording of the show goes out, so you don't need to worry about writing down. I know some of these are kind of complicated web addresses, so they will be made available to you after the fact. Um, but this is an article called Customized OPEX on the Semantic Web, and it explains the OpenCAT prototype. And to me, I thought it was explained in a really understandable way that didn't get too jargony, and it made some really good points about why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and one of the things I liked was that they, they detailed some of the usability testing that they did with the uh, linked data catalog. And the results were interesting. A lot of people really liked it. They liked you know, being able to search for Victor Hugo and not just see what their own library had, but see some of the things like the virtual exhibits. And other people were not so <laughs> into it. They were just thought this was just clutter, and they wanted to be able to see simply what their own library had. And so it's interesting to think about some of the pros and cons, maybe, of linked data resources. But I thought this was a really good way to get an idea of what linked data would mean for library catalogs in one sense, in the sense that you can bring in information from outside sources to your local catalog. <clears throat> and I guess the other benefit, or the other effect that I can see of linked data on libraries is kind of going the other way. Instead of bringing linked data uh, information into your catalog, it's making our catalog information more visible on the web as a whole. Um, I have attended a number of webinars by a company called Zafira, who originally partnered with um, the Library of Congress on their BibFrame project, and they have since gone separate ways, and Zafira is doing their own BibFrame projects, and Library of Congress is doing their own BibFrame projects. But um, a number of libraries have been partnering with Zafira to encode their data in a way that will show up automatically in a search engine without anybody having to go to the library's homepage. And we all know that 
people don't necessarily start their search at the library catalog. They probably start with Google, and they might, if they search something, if they specifically search for a library name, like Worthington Public Library, they'll probably get the library's homepage. But if they search for a resource, it won't automatically show up that it's held at a library. And so I like this quote from Chuck Gibson, the director of the Worthington Public Library. He said, when my community searches the web for something we have, we better show up as an option. And so the Denver Public Library is one of the partners with Zephira who is encoding their um, bibliographic information in linked data. And the example that they always, Zephira always gives in their webinars is if you go to Google and type in Molly Brown Papers, the first hit will be a direct link to the catalog page of the Denver Public Library for their archival material, the Margaret Molly Brown papers. Um, it won't be a link to the library's homepage. It won't be a link to just information about the papers. It is actually someplace where you can access those papers in a library. And that is because of the way they've encoded their data using linked data standards. And so lastly, I just kind of want to um, sum up this section on why librarians should care about linked data. Um, with the Library of Congress's summary of um, why it's important. They, the Library of Congress is currently doing a pilot project with their catalogers to actually catalog using BibFrame. And <clears throat> in the summary from the introduction to their training material, um, these are the things that they consider to be relevant. Libraries have a huge amount of identifiers. Um, Link data is all about identifying things in a standard way. Those entities that make up the RDF triples, those need to be um, identified in a standard way, which you know libraries are used to through authority headings and things like that. Um, so that, going along with that, number two, no community does authorities like we do. Um, we identify structure and organize data in different ways, but with WebFrame, we can leverage the existing web standards to make library content more visible with you know identifying structure and organize our data in a way that is workable with web standards. And I think, you know, we, I agree with them that we really can translate our MARC skills and practices into a linked data content. It's just a different kind of structured data. Now, I think I'll pause here for a second and see if anybody has any questions about kind of the background materials before I go into talking about the actual uh, tools, prototype tools that I, um, that is the, the meat of the presentation. Does anybody have any questions here? We haven't gotten anything yet, Sally, have we? I don't. Um, so uh, we have one question where they're asking about Zaf is it Zafira or Safira with a Z or with an S? It's Z Z E P H E I R A. Oh, I wouldn't have guessed yeah. that. <laughs> I'm glad they asked. Um, that's the only question we have at this time. Great. I'll interrupt that's you. Another, if something yeah, excellent question because yeah, that's not an intuitive <laughs> uh, <laughs> company name, but yeah, it starts with a Z, and they are doing a lot of innovation with linked data. Um, another, uh, if it's easier than googling Zafira, you can do libhub.org, and that is kind of their website where they are working with libraries on. A link data projects. That's l i b h u b dot org. Libhub is the initiative. Is their 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 project. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to kind of jump into talking about uh, cataloging tools of the future, as promised in uh, the title of the session. Um, and these are just different ways, I would say, of kind of envisioning what might be. A lot of them highlight kind of different aspects of in RDA, bib frame, linked data type of world, um, and they're you know in various levels of practicality as to something you can actually use now. But I think I've used all of them, and I they each have provided me with some different aha moments of oh yeah, this is my what it might be like working with um, our bibliographic data in a non-MARC world. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is called RDA in many metadata formats. Um, RIMF is the rather inelegant, inelegant acronym that they have for it. Um, and it is a free tool available for download from the MARC of Quality. And the URL is there. Again, these will all be available after this show with the recording. Um, and this you know, doesn't result in um, BibFrame, you know, XML encoded data that you can put into a catalog or anything, but I just thought it was a really interesting way of thinking about the various entities that 
Um, if you're familiar with RDA, you know, it breaks down the things that we catalog into work, expression, manifestation, and item, and so it separates out kind of the abstract um, content from the physical carrier, and RIMF is really good at sort of visualizing that, breaking down the pieces of information in our catalog records into works, entities, manifestations, and items, and then showing how the relationships between these entities work. Um, RIMF is kind of based on an entity index, what they call anything that you have created in RIMF a record for, um, a work, an expression, a manifestation, so on, um, shows up in the entity index. So if you want to see every single thing that you've created, you can see the entity index. And it also it makes it really easy to see different expressions of a particular work. Um, my main experience was with RIMF was at what they called the Janathon, a pre-conference event at last year's um, ALA Midwinter, and so we catalog things dealing with Jane Austen, and so here you can see that they have a number of different expressions of Pride and Prejudice in Spanish, German, Hungarian, Portuguese, and a lot of other languages. Those are all different expressions. And so to create that entity index, you create records for each of these separate RDA entities, work, expression, manifestation, and item. And what I found really useful about this was that it, it was really, you know, just reading through the text of the RDA rules, I found it really difficult to kind of think about what piece of information in a catalog record as we do it today relates to the work and what relates to the expression, what re relates to the manifestation. And so having completely separate records for each of these um, really made it solidify in my mind what types of information go with each. And so this is a work record. Um, we're creating a record for the work of Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. And this is, again, the most abstract level. It's the idea of Pride and Prejudice as it existed in Jane Austen's mind. And then it has all these expressions down here, and these blue ones mean that they are links to separate records for each of those individual expressions in different languages. <clears throat> and so here is one expression. Um, it is the Pride and Prejudice text, the language is English, um, and this is what I mean, you know, the, when you're broken down into these um, different records, you can see that the expression level is where um, things like the language of the expression come in. And here's another one, um, again, it's another expression relating to the same work, they all have the link to the same work, but this one has the qualifying information that it's Dutch, so it's a different expression. And same thing, this is one in German. And it's really, really labor intensive. Um, we sat there the whole day at the Janathon pre-conference and I mean, I don't think in a practical cataloging tool of the future you would necessarily want to have to have a separate work record and type out a separate expression record. Um, it might be easier to have them all on one screen, and we'll see some of these bib frame editors we're going to look at later. Um, they do have all the information on one screen, which leads to a really, really, really long record. But for conceptual development and sort of wrapping your head around the ideas of RDA and how it relates to linked data and BibFrame, I found RIMF really useful for that. So this is a free program that you can, it's not web-based, you do need to download it and put it on your computer, but um, I think it's really useful for playing around with and wrapping your head around linked data and how it can be expressed with, or wrap around RDA and how it can be expressed without Mark. The next tool I was going to talk about, a um, pair of tools, I would say, are BibFrame editors. Um, I mentioned that Zafira and Library of Congress have kind of gone their separate ways working on BibFrame, and they each have a BibFrame editor, um, which is, allows you to just simply type information into a BibFrame work form and might simulate what you might see in a postmark cataloging world. Uh, Zafira's BibFrame editor is called Scribe. And so there is the URL for that there. Um, and one thing I found comforting about this is that unlike um, RIMF, it pretty much presents you with just one long screen. Um, you choose from the side 
what type of item you're working with, sort of like choosing a work form in OCLC connection these days. So if you were doing a print book, for example, it would pop up the right fields that you would need to use. And, and basically you just type, what I found comforting, to go back to my original thought, um, was that you just, you type in the information. You know, you don't have to know mark tags or any other part of the encoding. I think a lot of the technical computer encoding part of BibBrain will be behind the scenes compared to Mark now. And so um, any of these boxes that just have text boxes are transcribed elements. You simply type something in there. Um, the ones that have kind of the plus sign after them, those are authorized headings. When you start typing things in there, it'll start auto-populating with information from these external services. You can choose, um, like the Library of Congress authority file, um, VOF, the Virtual International Authority file. These are places where information is available in a linked data format, and you can bring the identifiers to be your authority records, basically. And so that's kind of how Zafira's BibFrame editor is envisioning that we will work with uh, cataloging in the future. And as you can see, I said it's a really, really long screen because it brings together the work elements, the expression elements, the manifestation and item elements all on one page. And let me go back. Um, some of them are pre-populated based on what you chose. So if for a um, an ebook, you would have online resource for your carrier category already selected. So some of those are populated by your uh, choice of format. And then at the end, um, you can choose to export this in a um, XML link data encoded format if you have some kind of tool locally where you want to play around with the data. Um, if you want to simply just go to the website and see what it's like to input the data, that's fine. But if you also want to um, export it, you can do that as well with the BibFrame Scribe, um, Zafira Scribe BibFrame Editor. The Library of Congress also has a BibFrame Editor on their site. Um, bibframe.org slash tools is where you can get a variety of different tools, including the editor. Um, I believe that theirs can be downloaded, or you can just do the demo where you play it, play around with it online. So if you would like to do more extensive things, you can download a version to your own computer, but I have mostly stuck with the demonstration um, editor at this point. And it's pretty similar in some ways to the Zafira Scribe BibFrame editor. Um, again, you can kind of choose what profile, which again is sort of a work form, um, you're working with. They have um, kitchen sink profiles where they will bring in pretty much any element you would need for any type of item. And then they have um, profiles for a simple monograph. So if you want to play around with just a simple monographic book, um, you can get started on those as well. And you can choose whether you want to create a new instance and a work or just an instance or just a work. Um, for those of you maybe not so familiar with the BibFrame jargon, they've taken kind of the entities of work, expression, manifestation, item from RDA and condensed them into work and instance. Work is kind of the more abstract, um, I would say, work and expression in RDA, whereas instance uh, combines the manifestation and item information, the stuff that relates more to the physical item in your library collection. And so you choose um, which ones you want to create. And then again, it is um, pretty similar to the BibFrame or the Zafira editor in that there are, are ones where you transcribe information and then click set to make it stay. Um, any of these where there are just a button rather than a text box, these are the authorized fields. And again, like the Zafira editor, when you click on these, there'll be a place to type and then you know it'll auto-populate with um, information from the Library of Congress's authorities, which are available in a linked data format. And so again, you make the distinction between transcribed elements and authorized elements. And again, it has the work um, 
and instance information all on one page as opposed to the RIMF records. And so it's it's a fairly long screen, but it has things pretty clearly labeled, um, which information is about the work and which one is about the instance. And again, after you've filled in the work information at the top of the screen, um, it'll populate the instance where it links to the work information. And again, it's a very, very long <laughs> screen because um, it has these um, possible relationships that you know RDA builds in, things that allow for relationships to other resources. And then at the very end, it has um, the holding information, um, things that are extremely um, specific to one local library and their local call number, their shelf location, their lending policy, et cetera, et cetera. So it gets, it, again, I think it's a good example of how um, it makes it more concrete. You know, it's one thing to talk about the really abstract applications of linked data and everybody wants to know, well, how does a local library deal with this as far as holdings information? Because, you know, we, we don't just want to replicate the bibliographic information that we have in our catalogs, but we do need something that can use, you know, holding information, circulation information, things like that. And so I think the bib frame editor from the Library of Congress gets into that to a certain extent. Now, the editor is not the only tool that the Library of Congress has on their bibframe.org site. There's also a comparison service. And in this service, you look up the identification number of a record in the Library of Congress catalog online. And when you type that in, you'll get a comparison side by side of the MARC record versus the bibframe record. Okay, now I did take mar um, cataloging in my MLS courses, and yeah. MARC records were scary enough, and I'm just looking at this one. <laughs> I'm sure glad you're doing that. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, and, and like I said, you know, judging from the bibframe um, editors, you won't have to look at all this scary stuff too much. I mean, most of it will simply be typing in, well, the title goes here, and the, the author's name goes here, and we want to look up the authorized access point here. So you shouldn't have to see too much of that scary stuff, but... Um, that makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> so um, moving away from the Library of Congress uh, suite of tools, um, the next thing I want to talk about is, again, another piece of software that does need to be downloaded to your computer. It's not a web-based service, but Emily, it is freely. Could yes. I interrupt you for just a minute? Because we have Absolutely. a question over here. Oh, yes. Can you define what you mean by the word instance? Sure. Um, Instance is bib frame speak. Um, in their model, um, they separate the information about something that we're cataloging into a work and an instance. And the work is the more abstract information like the title, the you know, subject headings. It applies to you know, any physical format of this particular book. Whereas the instance um, deals with more specific physical information like whether it's a print book or an ebook. Um, what is the publisher of this particular edition of the print book. Um, an instance is something that really deals more with the actual item sitting on the shelf in your library or something you can use as a doorstop um, as opposed to the abstract content information, I guess, that would apply to any kind of physical uh, representation of that particular resource that you're cataloging. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll let you go on to your next option here. Okay. The next option I'm talking about is um, a suite of 
cataloging and metadata tools called MarkEdit. Um, it's a totally free program um, developed by a wonderful librarian named Terry Reese out of Ohio, the Ohio State University. And he is continually refining it. Um, it has a lot of other options that I'm not even going to talk about right now because um, it has a lot of options for dealing with traditional MARC cataloging and batch editing of MARC records. Um, I'm going to stick purely to the suite of tools he calls MARC Next. Um, and if you have MarkEdit, once you have it installed on your computer, this will be the screen that you see when you open it up. And the Mark Next or this little science lab looking icon over here to indicate that we are playing around with what things that might come after um, Mark. And he has a couple of different options here. Um, one of which I'm going to talk about is the link identifiers option. Um, as I've been saying all along, an important thing about linked data is to link to other sources of information and to have standard ways of identifying this information. So um, URIs, Uniform Resource Identifiers, are a way of making a particular entity represented on the web, basically. Um, and so, you know, even while we're still continuing to catalog in MARC, one possibility that people are considering is to continue or is to begin to incorporate these identifiers, the URIs, into our MARC records. And so uh, Terry's link identifier function does just that. Um, you upload a file of MARC records and it goes out on the web and looks for identifiers that have been made available in linked data. And so you know, this is the authorized um, authority record heading for Jennifer Schmidt's name, but she also exists as an identifier in the Library of Congress's um, linked data um, information. Um, same thing with um, subject headings. Traffic safety, it has the text string, but then it also in a subfield zero puts the URI for the identifier in. So, you know, your catalogs won't really be able to do anything with this now because our ILS systems are not set up that way, but looking ahead towards some bright future down the line, it might help to have these identifiers already um, created in our bibliographic data. And so some people are doing that um, using the link identifiers. Even if you're not actually going to put this data into your catalog, I think it's kind of cool to just see the kind of information that's out there and sort of get the sense for how our bibliographic data could link to other data sets that are already available out there in link data format. Okay, Emily, we have another question that might make yes. it take a step back. Um, okay. I'm going to read it here. You've mentioned that with the bib frame editors, most of the scary stuff will be hidden. <laughs> Do you think that's a disservice to future catalogers who would benefit from being able to better understand what's happening with the data being entered? Huh, that is a very good question. Um, and I think it depends upon the particular cataloger and how involved they want to be um, with the data. I certainly think it would behoove anybody who is interested in the programming and the back end of it to to definitely be aware of what is going on behind the scenes. I think, you know, um, as our cataloging tools continue to evolve, it might be a disservice if you're just blindly typing things in. Um, on the other hand, I think maybe it's a lower barrier to entry for some people who you know, really just want to be on the the front end side of things. Um, and that way it might make cataloging more accessible. But I, I certainly think there is room for a particular breed of cataloger who is a cataloger slash programmer and wants to know what's going on in both the front and back end. So um, I don't know if that's really an answer to your question, but I think it, it will I think it will depend on the person, honestly. I think that's a good answer. And now I have one more question, and then we'll yes. get back to your presentation. Since our catalogs are not BibFrame compliant, at least at this point in time, will the dollar zero be invisible to the end user for now? I think it should be, yes. Um, I would assume that your catalog is set up in a way to only display the more traditional subfields in you know, a 100 field or a 650 field or... In most systems, I would think that if it's not currently, there would be a way to, to turn that off. So, yeah, I think that right now this is purely a behind-the-scenes thing that will be useful someday. But I would, yeah, I would not expect that to display or do anything in your catalogs right now. Okay, thank you. Now I'll, I'll stop interrupting for a little bit. Nope. 
I appreciate the interruption. I definitely want to get questions answered at the point of contact as much as possible, because, yeah, there's a lot of stuff here, and we're moving quickly from one thing to the next. Um, the other tool in the Mark Edit suite of tools, so this is, again, the same software, but a different function within the Mark Next suite is the um, BibFrame testbed. Again, it's available if you click on that little Mark Edit science lab icon. Um, and this does um, kind of similar to like the Zephira BibFrame editor. If you type in something and then you export it and that you can get the really you can really get your hands into the code. Um, and then with this function you take a batch of mark records and you upload it and it spits out um, the RDF um, version of it. So if you really have you know, a, a batch of data that you want to take and either just look at it to see what it looks like or you have some kind of tool that will actually let you deal with um, linked data and you want to convert a bunch of stuff so that you can play around with it, the BibFrame testbed is the place to do that in MarkEdit. And the last tool that I'm going to talk about is a web-based, well, no, you do have to download this one as well. Um, tool called OpenRefined. Um, you can download it from the website openrefined.org. And again, similar to Mark Edit, this one has a lot of functions that are really, really cool, and I could spend all day talking about it, but they don't necessarily relate to the linked data stuff we're talking about here, so um, I will brain myself in and only talk about the linked data options. Mark, I will just leave it with saying that OpenRefine is a really cool tool for cleaning up inconsistencies in your metadata if you want to, you know, find fields where people have left off the period when there should be one and easily correct it without having to touch individual records, definitely look into OpenRefine. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is um, using OpenRefine in order to link your data to other data that is out there on the web already. Um, this requires downloading the OpenRefine software, uh, downloading an extra extension called the RDF extension, which converts to RDF, Resource Description Framework. Um, and this is something that takes a really, really long time to run in real time, so I, I'm definitely just sticking to <laughs> screenshots here. Um, basically, you tell it where you want to get the data from. You have to know a source of linked data on the web, and you tell it how you want it to match. Um, in this case, we're matching to the Library of Congress subject headings. And so it runs its test, and it takes ages and ages. Um, when I've attended webinars about this, the people who have used it for big projects call this the go get a cup of coffee step. Um, but um, when you're done, whatever ta uh, column you selected, in this case they were matching categories to the Library of Congress subject headings, um, the overall kind of slider over here tells you how the percentage of which ones were matched. So we'll see that we got almost half, I suppose the green is how much were matched. Um, if something just comes up as a blue term, that means it matched it in, it found a Library of Congress subject heading, and so now that field in your data is linked and it has the identifier from the Library of Congress subject headings as linked data. Um, sometimes there will be multiple ones that might sort of match, and so you have to kind of go through and decide which one you want. And sometimes if they just are plain black, that means they didn't match at all. And so you have to decide what you want to do about it if you want to uh, maybe bring in another vocabulary that you can match to as well if it didn't match in Library of Congress. But either way, it just sets up your data for um, matching to linked data out there on the web, and then it'll set you up for you know, going ahead and publishing your own data and you know, linking in to the web of linked data, so to speak. So that was, now I know that was really a whirlwind tour. I didn't, you know what? Didn't expect you to come away as experts on any of those tools, but um, I just wanted to kind of give you the idea that they're out there. So if you're feeling like you know, in theory, what linked data and BibFrame is all about, but you'd like to get some ways to play around with this type of data, um, I wanted to make sure you had these tools available to you. Um, if you do have any questions after the fact, um, there's my email address there. Um, that is my own SlideShare uh, website, and I will be putting these slides up. They will also be available on the Encompass Live um, Web page and Krista will send them out with the recording. Um, do we have any other questions coming in? I'm not seeing anything yet. We'll just give people a minute if they want sure. to type in. 
another Absolutely. question. Or maybe you'll be getting emails in a couple of yes, days. Yes, which asking. is certainly fine. I realize this is the type of stuff where it takes a while to sink in sometimes. So somebody will wake up in the middle of the night with a question about open refine or something. And <laughs> I will be happy to answer it next week. Maybe not on Thanksgiving Day, but um, next week I think week for that's sure. reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question. What are, you, what are your recommendations for how catalogers should prepare for the upcoming changes? Ah, that is a good question. Um, well, if you actually want to do, you know, as far as preparing your data, I think that you know, doing things like the Mark Edit um, Link Identifiers tool is pretty good. Um, even outside of that, I think um, just becoming kind of consistent in the way you identify relationships in your catalog. Um, you know, the relationship designators in RDA are optional, so you know, using subfield E for author in your 100 field, it's optional, but I think that anything we can do to explicitly identify relationships in our data will make it a lot easier to make those relationships implicit as far as the computer encoding when the big frame Brave New World dawns. I think that that um, is something, being really mindful about how you handle relationships in your, your uh, bibliographic data is um, something important. Um, and other than that, I would just probably recommend being aware, educating yourself, doing things like attending this webinar, um, knowing what's coming, being um, educated enough to talk to your vendor to see what your ILS vendor is doing. Um, a number, a, a few anyway, vendors are also partnering with Zafira. I mentioned libraries were their partners, but I know that um, Circe Dynex and III, they are both supposed to be working on the LibHub initiative. So. Um, Definitely doing, you know, I feel like when the RDA rules were implemented, it was kind of a chicken and egg scenario. The librarians were waiting to see what the vendors were doing, and the vendors were waiting for the librarians to ask them and tell them what to do. And so um, be, be proactive about that with your vendor and, and see what they're doing. And if they don't have good answers for you, definitely push them on that. And I guess that would be, those would be my recommendations, you know, try and be consistent with your data, um, keep yourself well educated, and bug your vendors. <laughs> That sounds great. We have another <laughs> that says, thanks so much for this webinar. Thank you for your time, Emily. We really appreciate it. Um, and I imagine people will be emailing you as they think about it, like you said. Well, that is definitely, they're more than welcome to do that. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. Oh, several more thank yous. Oh, good. <laughs> and one from me, too. And I'm hoping that when I click on this, it shows our Encompass Live um, on our the Library Commission webpage. Are you seeing that now? Uh, no. As far as I can tell, it's still showing my screen. Oh, okay. um, I'm not sure how to do that. See, see. Oh, this is what happens when you have a rookie. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to make you the presenter. Okay. I'll take that. <laughs> I'll give it back to you. And then it should give you the okay. option to show your okay. screen. Now it's, I think I'm showing yes. my screen now. I just wanted to show you uh, the Library Commission webpage. Uh, you can go to that and search for Encompass Live in the search box and then the information comes up that shows here's our upcoming shows. Well this one right here is just now completing but these are our upcoming shows and just below that are archived Encompass Live sessions. So if you want to watch this again you can go right there and click on that and after Krista puts it up and, and, and puts in the links and everything for you you can sure go there and find the information you need to view this or a portion of this again. Um, thank you for joining us and thank you again Emily for being our presenter today. We really appreciate it. Thanks and, for having me. And have a wonderful Thanksgiving everybody.